Since creation, humans were never meant to be alone. And since creation, there has always been the temptation to withdraw. Loneliness seems safer and easier. But community is what brings us life and strength and fills our life with meaning. Our community picks us up when we fall and carries us when we get weak. Our community helps us shoulder our burdens when they get too heavy. We need people speaking life into us and growing alongside us. Our life was never truly meant to be done alone. God wants us to be in community and the enemy wants us isolated. Because when we gather, change happens. When we're together, all of hell waits. We do far more for the kingdom of God when we come together. And while isolation seems tempting and easy, isolation will bring inevitable discouragement. So we must fight the ever persistent temptation to pull away and rather to unite together. Just remember, you don't have to do it alone. You weren't created to. Well, thank you for being here. I'd like to welcome you to the celebration of life service for Jordan, Hansen, and Tara. <laughs> I always wondered what my funeral would be like, and now I know, so. <laughs> uh, I'm just especially grateful to our church for so many things, but one thing that I mentioned to the Dream Team was I'm just so grateful for. How you've loved our kids. I don't know if you saw the little stuffies and that, just, this church has loved our kids so well. And our kids love church. Can we give it up for Mesa Church for loving kids? I mean, how important is it for our kids to know what we know and the faith that we have? It's just incredible. Um, my kids love stuffies. In fact, when my daughter was young, she had a stuffy called Lammy. Can you guess what Lammy was? <laughs> Very creative. Um, yeah, it was this little stuffed animal. And I'm telling you, if Lammy was lost, we were all lost. <laughs> and now all my kids have stuffies. Not just one stuffy. They have a whole collection of stuffies. Uh, someone told me this week that they didn't let their kids have stuffies. I was like, that's brilliant. That's brilliant like so smart. Why didn't I have someone mentor me early in the parenting career? It was brilliant, but it's too late for us. We went down the stuffy path, and now we are stuck. For my kids, a stuffy represents a very real sense of comfort, a soft, plush, pillow-like animal uh, that can be hugged when afraid or going to sleep or dragged around the courtyard so all their friends can witness, and they lean in to that stuffy or their family of stuffies, when they're happy, sad, confused, or whatever. And uh, turns out, turns out that we're not so different. Why do we lean into the lamb? That's going to be the question that I ask today. I want to welcome you to Mesa Church. This is a unique Sunday. If you're here for the very first time, um, this is a unique Sunday to show up. <laughs> and I, I do think you're going to have a good time, but I'm just just warning you, you've already been warned, I guess. Um, but we're so grateful for you. In fact, our church really believes of the importance of uh, this church being a place for people who are not here yet. And we've really, I don't know, fought hard for that kind of a culture, a culture where uh, we are doing things for people who aren't here yet. And uh, it's been one of the amazing things that we've, Tara and I, have participated in. Um, but this series has been a series on community. And if you're curious about why we chose the idea of community, um, it, you know, one message is really not enough to, to uh, 
you know, to have some famous last words, but I really believe that January and February are some of my heart's messages for this church. Five weeks on the Holy Spirit, and then these last five weeks on this idea of koinonia, or fellowship, or community, or what it means to be together as a church. So you have uh, the mission of God, which is propelled us into the world by the Holy Spirit, but we're doing it together as a family of believers following Jesus, um, addressing the very real issues that we see happening all around us as much as we can as individuals and as a community. So I do want to welcome you. Uh, This is my last sermon as 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 the lead pastor at Mesa Church, but hopefully it's not my last sermon at Mesa Church. And so I I hope to be back with you to encourage you and to be encouraged by you at some point in my life. But I've titled this series, Leaning Into the Lamb. So leaning into comfort, uh, leaning into mission, leaning into prayer, leaning into relationship, and now leaning into the lamb. What do I mean by the lamb? Why do we lean into a lamb? What is a lamb anyways? If you're not a Christian, you're thinking, do these people just like animals or what? (laughs) Well, we'll get there leaning into the lamb. Most of us uh, have given our stuffies to our kids or our grandkids, um, so we don't have the stuffies anymore. Uh, They get lost along the way, but we still need to be stabilized in a world that is jolting. We need to be comforted in a world that is scary. We, We still, as adults, need to express deep joy in a world that is stuck in depression. We still need to be hugged in a world where hugs aren't always just hugs. God desires to be that close to us, to meet our deepest emotional and spiritual needs, and it just so happens that he describes himself as a lamb. Now, I'm going to read a passage from the book of Revelation, okay? I know. Why go Revelation on your last Sunday? (laughs) Bold. (laughs) Stupid. I don't know. One of of it, but but I want to give you a little background on the text that I'm going to be reading today from chapter 7. John is writing a revelation from God. Um, uh, It means an unveiling. Revelation means unveiling. Uh, It's actually apocalypse in Greek, and it means an unveiling or a revelation. Uh, It contains literature describing visions, symbols, and prophecies about the end times, the return of Christ, the final judgment, and the establishment of God's kingdom. It is confusing for us to read, but it is meant for us to read. We know from the letters of John that we are in the last hour. 1 John 2.18 says, and this will mess up your end time theology, but it's straight scripture. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. The passage I'm going to read is right in between the sixth and the seventh seal. And if you're here today to get a university level unpacking of the book of Revelation, you've come to the wrong place. But I will say this about Revelation. This letter would have been understood to its original audience. And its original audience would have been deeply comforted by the ultimate victory that Jesus had already secured on the cross. In the midst of the chaos of their reality, suffering, persecution, and real life consequences for choosing to follow Jesus, the author of Revelation paints a picture of the throne room. Right in the middle of all of the hard stuff, he paints a picture of the throne room of heaven. Why? So that we can have the hope of heavenly worship in our hearts while living through the tough stuff of earth. You see, we were made to be close to God in worship. Revelation 7, 19, 17 says this. got to find my place here. After this, I looked up and I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language. In fact, if If you're not reading, I want you to go ahead and just close your eyes and in your mind's eye, try to imagine what John is describing in his vision. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, 
from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. There, that reference is the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God, who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings, and they all fell before the throne with their faces to the ground and worshiped God, and they sang, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the 24 elders asked me, Who are these who are clothed in white? Where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, These are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and made them white. That is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will give them shelter. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorched by the heat of the sun. For the lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Lord, we just bow our hearts to you today. And we uh, point our attention to the throne room of heaven where you sit at the right hand of God and you sit at the very center of the throne itself. I pray that you would fix our eyes on you. You are the author and perfecter of our faith. And in you all things are made new. You have given us new hearts. You have transformed our lives. And you are walking with us day and night. You are our shepherd. And we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I want to talk about leaning into the Lamb today. I want to talk about the Lamb. This Lamb that the book of Revelation talks about. Who is the Lamb? If you've been around Christianity for a long time, or Judaism, you've you know something about lambs. Lambs are referenced in the Bible, in the New Testament and the Old Testament. The New Testament identifies the lamb as Jesus. So why would we lean into the lamb? I want to give you three reasons why we would lean into the lamb today as a community, why we would lean into the lamb. When I first announced, I said, you know, in situations like this where there's a transition or a change, you can make a decision to lean out or you can make a decision to lean in. And I've tried to give you five biblical reasons to lean in. Today we're going to talk about leaning in to the Lamb. The first reason we lean into the Lamb is because the Lamb unites humanity. You know if you study the end times that and if you just study culture, that there are lots of brands, lots of leaders, lots of politicians who make all sorts of promises, and they always do the same thing. They fail. <laughs> because no one will ever be able to unite humanity like the one who created it. The lamb will succeed. But this isn't just a vast congregation, a vast crowd of people it is a diverse congregation. It's not a big room full of Republicans or a big room full of Democrats. I'm an equal opportunity offender, just so you know. <laughs> or a big room full of black people or white people or brown people. By the way, Jesus was brown, just so you know. It was a great multitude of people from every part of the globe, all created in the image of God. A multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. All unified, standing, worshiping before the Lamb, it says here in the text. And they came from a diverse background culturally and racially and probably chronologically, right? 
the disciples of 2,000 years ago, I wonder what they would think of all of our first world problems in this century. But we're there. They're there. All of these martyrs are there at the same time. And they're all clothed in white robes, which is symbolic of purity or righteousness, divine glory. These are people who have been forgiven. Not that they have lived perfect lives, but they have placed their faith in the Lamb who died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, for all that would reach out for it. They are standing with right, white robes in the presence of angels looking on. And they have palm branches in their hands, which symbolize victory. Now think of these early Christians who would have been listening to this passage and they are getting persecuted in their real life. They needed to know in their hearts and in their souls that all of their pain and suffering has an end point. That they too would hold those palm branches in victory like the worshipers did on Palm Sunday when Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And friends, we are a part of a multitude of diverse peoples gathered around the throne of the Lamb. Every time we gather to worship, we are gathering with every single church on the face of the planet, whether it's South America or Asia or Africa or Antarctica or Ohio. <laughs> and this has given me great comfort over the last few months. Because we are a part of something that is much bigger than Mesa Church. It's much, much bigger than Christian Life Center. It's why we give to missions. It's why we support people who are spreading the message of Jesus to every nation on the face of this planet. Somehow, God is building something out of a diversity of resources. One of my favorite mentors who has gone on to be with the Lord preached a sermon at this church. His name was George. It reads, God has placed us as living stones in this body. We are not prefab, preformed construction material. We are quarried from the real stuff of life, fitted into one another to make the beautifully colored and variated mosaic of God's church. One of the necessary functions of God's fitting us together is the chipping and or sanding away of the sharp edges. That's for me, not you, by the way. You don't have any sharp edges. God is using the difference in my brother as a cutting instrument, lopping off my impatience, judgmentalness, smugness, and spiritual ego. God has not called us to be like each other, but to be like Jesus. And the more I become like Jesus, the more I truly am myself, and the less I try to be like my brother or sister. The more I become like Jesus, the more I accept the uniqueness also of my brother and sister. In this way, I find true unity in the body, not the carbon copy imitation in a body which mistakes similarity for the true unity of the spirit. God has not called this church to be a cookie cutter with all the cookies neatly rolling down the conveyor belt with the same sameness. We must not seek the outward stamp of uniformity, but the inward stamp of the Holy Spirit who bears witness that we are the children of God. This happens because the Lamb has united us. So why can the Lamb unite humanity? What did he do in order to perform this impossible feat that many leaders have tried and failed at? And the answer is found in verse 12. The Lamb provides salvation. You see, we try and save ourselves, which is pride. We try to do anything we can to prop ourselves up to feel good enough about our lives. And we try to save ourselves. Secular salvation. You might not hear it said like that, but it's, it's this idea that we can be given to a cause so big and we can be a part of the saving of other people. If I can just give you a financial plan that will work for you or make you a million of dollars through social media or if I can help encourage you to buy a franchise of this organization or something and for some reason we get it in our heads that we can save people. And we're just like all those leaders who have tried to unite people based on superficial, artificial, humanly characteristics. But the Lamb doesn't provide salvation through human means. By the way, why are we calling Jesus the Lamb? 
this would probably be a, a good place to explain the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Passover lamb is a Jewish story, a story that's found in Exodus chapter 12, 1 through 14, when the Israelites are trying to be freed from the Egyptian slave, slaveries, slavery. And the Pharaoh, who literally thought he was God, I mean, just imagine that, a unifier of people under his own power and for his own purposes, and his purposes were a lot different than God's, hey, build these amazing pyramids for me to give me glory. And God said, eh, I don't think so. Even in the grace of God, he gives Pharaoh 10 tries to, to back off. I mean, if you ever thought that God was being mean or judgmental to Pharaoh, how, how many of you have forgiven someone 10 times, okay? 10 of those plagues, opportunity to back off. He doesn't back off. And God shows himself to be supreme. And the final plague or the final judgment was the, the taking back of the firstborn. All gifts, all, all children are gifts from the Lord. All, all of life is a gift from the Lord. Um, but the Israelites had special instructions. Paint the blood of a blemishless lamb on your doorposts and on the sides. And the angel, the destroyer angel, the, the one who was uh, set up to carry out this act of judgment would pass over you. That's why Jews celebrate the Passover meal. And it wasn't until Jesus comes onto the scene where John the Baptist actually identifies Jesus as the Passover lamb. He says this in John 1.29, the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so we celebrate the ultimate symbolic meaning of the Passover lamb through the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross and the empty tomb. And we recognize that our salvation is found through Jesus not slaughtering a real physical sheep. Jesus, God of very God, and I'm going to get to that here in a second, came to earth in the flesh, God of very God, but also 100% human, fulfilled the destiny of the ultimate Pascal lamb or Passover lamb by going to the cross and dying for the sins, not just of the Jewish people, but for all Gentiles, for all Jews, for all nations. Remember the crowd we just talked about? For anyone who would lift up the name of Jesus and identify his work on the cross as being for them. By the way, you have to set your pride aside to be able to acknowledge that. Because it takes humility to say, I need Jesus. And I need his perfection. And I need his kindness. And I need his gentleness. And since I've had kids, I've realized I need all of those fruits, okay? All of those characteristics of Jesus that I'm supposed to have, but I recognize that I don't. And that's why Jesus went to the cross to unite humanity by providing salvation, a way back to the Father because our sins separated us from him. But his death on the cross brought us back into relationship. Jim Elliott um, said, Father, make me a crisis man. Bring those I contact to decision. Let me not be a milepost on a single road. Make me a fork that men must turn one way or another on facing Christ in me. And one of the things that we recognize in the ministry of Jesus is that he said lots of controversial things. Probably the most controversial was, no man comes to the Father except through me. It was no less controversial back then as it is today. The moment you start to talk about the exclusive claims of Jesus, we, we just want all roads lead to God. And yet, the revelation of Jesus' own teaching about himself was that it would only happen through relationship with the lamb that was slaughtered before the foundations of the earth were laid. So he lays out a plan for salvation, and he doesn't expect us to fulfill it, but he actually fulfills the plan on our behalf because he knows that we couldn't. The story of Abraham making covenant with God is a reflection of that. He puts Abraham to sleep, and he walks through the middle of the animal parts. In other words, Abraham, step aside. 
you won't be able to do this. I know you won't be able to do this. The Jewish people weren't able to fulfill the law, but Jesus did perfectly. Remember, we walked through the Ten Commandments, and we talked about how Jesus fulfilled all of the moral law of the Old Testament. And so the Lamb provides salvation. And when we choose to follow Jesus, we become one of those signs that Jim Elliott talks about, one of those forks in the road. And if you've ever wondered why someone who doesn't even know you, doesn't like you, but they know that you're a Christian, you might have a reason. I say might because you also might just be an annoying person. (laughs) And I'm sure I've annoyed a lot of people in my life. In fact, I've thought a lot about that over the last eight and a half years. I don't want my preaching style to be offensive to people. I don't want to be too loud or too this or too that, but, but I want the content of my preaching to do what Jesus intended, to cause a fork in the road. I was out to lunch with one of the guys in our church, and I love him. I'm not going to say his name, but I am just throwing a bone out there to him right now. He said, you know, when I first met you and listened to your preaching, I really didn't like you. I don't know, maybe I didn't tell enough stories, whatever. You know, Pastor Scott, he was like the best storyteller ever, (laughs) you know. So I came in and my style was so different that it caused a little bit of a culture, you know. Um, But then he said, but then I realized why I didn't like you. Because in your preaching, you talked about commitment. And you talked about serving Jesus. And you talked about being wholeheartedly devoted to him. And in my heart, I was like, man, this is like the best backhanded compliment I've ever been given. (laughs) But it is a compliment. (laughs) And he meant it that way. He really meant it that way. I thought, yes. Remember quoting that for Johanna Townsend's funeral. You know, many of us know Johanna. And I quoted that quote of being a fork in the road. She was a fork. You, you, You couldn't be in relationship with Johanna and not come to that place of decision. Our services and our lives must clearly point people to Jesus. And when they don't accept Christ, we must continue to love them because they are God's creations made in the image of God, and there's no hook on our love. Just like there's no hook on God's love. It's not a hidden catch. Come to Christ. I'm not ready. Well, guess what the Holy Spirit does? Oh, I'm just going to pursue you more. And we are like Jesus. We, We love people not to get them saved, but we love people because God loves them. And we love them. And we want God's best for them. We want the very best in life for them. We don't want them to struggle or hurt or try to save themselves when we know they can't save themselves. So we clearly point people to Jesus so they can actually be saved. This is why I'm flabbergasted by churches that don't preach the gospel. It's like we're gathering a whole bunch of people who are damned in their sin for eternity, and yet they have community. Jesus, 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 Jesus is the only way to the Father. And all of the things that you think you want in your heart, they happen when you surrender to Christ. You will experience a peace in the midst of the storm. You will experience joy when everyone else is sad around you. You will have a mission in life that is not just a cause-based way to save yourself, but you will have a purpose to live for eternity and a community that will get behind you. By the way, even when you screw up and mess up, that's the message of Mesa. Because we come to church, not because we're perfect, but because we're admitting that we need Jesus to save us. Let's be honest, how many of you, you get in a fight on the way to church with your kids? (laughs) So do I. I'm like, I walk into worship and I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. I just need to unload this burden. Forgive me, please. Or your spouse or your neighbor or something, you know? 
I've learned sheep. <laughs> I stole this from Pastor Stan, but sheep are carnivorous. <laughs> and by the way, I am a sheep also. <laughs> We clearly point people to Jesus so that they can actually be saved. So the lamb unites humanity, and he's united us in salvation. And then we hear a little bit of the content as to why these are all worshiping. The lamb is the shepherd who is worthy of worship. Worship means to focus our entire lives onto God. Verse 11 through 12 says, all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. How many places in scripture where you actually get and worshiped God? There's a lot of places in scripture that allude to the heart or allude to a posture or allude to prayer, but this is as specific as you can get. Amen, which by the way is the same word Jesus uses whenever he says, truly, truly, I say to you, amen is the same word. So Jesus is saying, amen, or truly, truly, amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever, amen. Verse 17, that's, those are the angels and the elders and the living creatures, and then the people, 17, for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. Eugene Peterson says, worship is the strategy by which we interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves and attend to the presence of God. We actually worship the sacrifice on the cross. We worship the Lamb of God, Jesus, who sits at the very center of the throne by attending to his presence. Sometimes we read passages where we hear the reference to the Father, the reference to the Holy Spirit, the reference to Jesus or the Lamb, and we are trying to figure out how does the Trinity work. And this is one of those passages that has a really powerful connection because in verse 17, and by the way, I included a theme study in this particular set of notes. You can download it online. Where is Jesus? That's a great question. And I've listed all of the places where it states in the New Testament where Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. And yet in this passage, John states very clearly in verse 17, for the Lamb at the center of the throne. John is stating here in very, in no uncertain terms that it is the Lamb of God that we are worshiping. The Lamb who was slain. The Lamb of God. That sacrifice whose blood erased the sins of the Israelites so they could, the angel could pass over and they could go to the promised land. And we are grafted into that Jewish promise of a Jewish Messiah who is still Jewish, by the way, so that we could follow Jesus to the heart of God. We enter into the throne room of God because of the sacrifice of Jesus, our salvation, and we worship the Lamb who sits on the throne who is worthy of worship. Why? Because only God is worthy of worship. You, we can't worship humans. This church is not about me. CLC is not about me. There's no churches that are about their lead pastors. Leaders come and go. Jesus remains. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is at the center of the throne. And when we attend to the presence of the living God sitting in the throne of heaven, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, we will experience a purpose so deeply embedded into our hearts that we will wonder why it took so long to get our thoughts off of ourselves. Side note, the greatest lie that we believe today in Christianity is that worship is for us. Worship has a benefit to us. <laughs> but worship is directed to God. It is the natural and most organic thing that can take place when you recognize the created order. God of all. And us, human creatures, made in his image. 
And I loved Pastor Keith's message last week. Uh, he gave us a one-word prayer that I'm going to take with me. Wow. A one-word prayer. And just so you know, that prayer is also worship. Because wow is worship. This summer, our family went to Yosemite National Park. Just quick poll. Have you been to Yosemite National Park? Okay, I have a homework assignment for all of the rest of you. Okay, you have to promise that you will do everything in God's power, okay, to go to Yosemite National Park. It is gorgeous. It is beautiful. You will feel God's presence there. It's just one of those places where it's like you see the masterpiece of the Creator just designing. I want to show you a picture of the view that I saw as we came through the tunnel. I think you may have remembered that for the first time when you drove through that tunnel. And I had no idea that I had seen that view before. I'd never been to Yosemite National Park, but I had seen that before many times. Why? Because someone took that picture, or a picture like that, and sold it to Bill Gates and Microsoft, and now it's on every laptop in America. <laughs> I, I, was, I, I was like, I recognize that. I've been here. Wait a second. I've not been here. How do I know this? Oh, I've been looking at that since I had a laptop. It's one of the photos that I was seeing. And we got out our car, and you could see a photo of us. We took a photo of us at Yosemite National Park. We had a great time. It's great with kids. Um, yeah, you could take that photo off, just go back to the nature. And, and then, <laughs> and then I, as I was standing there, though, and I realized just, I was just having one of those moments. Have you ever had a spiritual moment in creation? It's just the Holy Spirit and, whoa, God, you are real. You are big. You are awesome. Wow. The most genuine one-worded prayer of worship that maybe I've ever said my whole life. And then the Holy Spirit said, you think this is cool? Just wait. You're enamored by a place, but just wait. Wait, because someday you will stand before me in person. And you will look into my eyes, the one who died for you on the cross, the one who long before then stretched out this universe, God of very God, but then entered into our world to where we live, into the muck and mire of our existence, and came to where we were. Just wait. Just wait. Jesus, you are worthy of worship, not just because you created the world, but you created me. And you have forgiven me, and you have led me to a good place a land flowing with milk and honey where forgiveness and grace and mercy are freely given and where I can live in the shadow of your wings, cared for, loved, and I can create space for other people to experience all of that. So what's our response? Well, I hope you never forget this statement. It's a weird one, but I think our response to leaning into the worship of the Lamb is to loosen our tent pegs. And I think this is something that our church has already begun to do so powerfully. So just to go back, we, un we unite with people who are different than us who have found Christ. We proclaim the good news to anyone who will listen. And we live our lives as worship, humble, Jesus-centered, and dependent. We live lives with loose tent pegs. When we loosen our tent pegs by uniting with people who are different than us, proclaiming the good news to anyone who will listen, and living our lives as worship, humble, Jesus-centered, and dependent, our tent pegs, our cultural tent pegs, will be pulled up from the ground and God will be able to gather more people. I saw this, this when I first got to the church. It was something that was in a, like a box somewhere. I think Bobby may have showed it to me. I, I can't remember. what It says a prophetic promise. And I read this. 
This was in the first couple weeks of my pastoral ministry at Newport Mesa. It says, truly, truly, which now you know means just amen (laughs) in Greek. I say unto you, my children, these are not days for faint hearts and weakened knees, but to the contrary, these are days of strong hearts and firm knees, strengthened in the power of my spirit, for my hand is upon this house, and as I spoke before, loosen thy pegs and lengthen thy ropes, for the days of thy increase are almost upon thee, and I will send a surge of peoples towards the doors as a mighty wave towards the shore." And if thy walls are unyielding and thy ropes stretched taut, how shall they enter before they shall go? Look unto me, and I will give thee firmness of faith, and thou shalt stand as surely as the Lord thy God stands in the midst. This was an anonymous note written to Pastor George Wood at Newport Mesa Christian Center in the fall of 1971 when the church had 100 people. And there was a great surge after that. But you know what I've learned about the Pacific Ocean? Waves come in sets. I hope you hear this because this is bigger than Mesa. I believe a set is coming to Southern California. And churches in Southern California need to loosen the tent pegs. The mission field is ripe, but workers are few, Jesus said. It's not about the buildings physically. It's about the building spiritually. You are the temple of Christ. You are the temple where the Holy Spirit dwells. And when your life is rigid and taut and you cannot be flexible enough to follow the God that you serve, who was willing to go to the cross, by the way. Love what Bill Doctrine said. Following Jesus was, Jesus didn't die so that we wouldn't have to, but so that we would know how to. When you have loose tent pegs and you're just, Jesus, I, I'm down for whatever. I want to worship you with my whole life. I want Mesa Church to succeed. I want every single church in Orange County to succeed. That their harvest would and people would find the faith family that God has created the church to be. Because I believe that when it happens here, it's going to spread. And I want to be on the back end of that tsunami. I want that wave to reach me in Dayton, Ohio. I'm going to Dayton because God's calling me there. But he's not calling me to be a part of a different congregation. He's calling me to be, has a different assignment for me. But we're all a part of this beautiful thing called the church. I want you to stand up today because there's only one thing that unites us as a congregation. It's not me. It's, it's not even this building that we have or the bylaws of Mesa Church. It's Jesus. Christ crucified the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. And for anyone who would be willing to give up their pride and say, I need that. Would you bow your heads with me? If that's you today, if you have been battling this and fighting this, but you know you can't save yourself and you know you need something different, you have nothing to lose by saying, Jesus, I need help. Another one word prayer from last week. Help. Please, let, as my final way of leading you, would you be willing to say this simple prayer? Jesus, save me. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, lead me. It's the one thing that unites all of us together. Jesus, let's worship him this morning.